Greetings from Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very much hope that this video finds you well wherever you are in the world. And I would very much like to continue on with the Q&A videos. Today, I think by my count, we are at Q&A part 10. So I'm picking up where I left off at the last Q&A, and this is the question from Heirloom Providence, our dear friend Heirloom Providence. I hope you're doing well, my friend. It's always nice to see you. And you say, hello, Daisuke. Three questions. Apologies to you if you've gotten them before or anyone who has asked them, and I'm unknowingly repeating the questions. Okay. Number one, is there one film in particular that upon first viewing, maybe even a second that you didn't enjoy or connect with but later on came to love and vice versa is there a movie you enjoyed on the first viewing that hasn't held up the same for you in later viewings okay so this is very interesting um, I think let me answer that first question um, uh, is there a film that I saw that I didn't like but upon subsequent viewings I ended up liking or perhaps even loving I've mentioned the example of eight and a half uh, the Fellini work uh, when I saw it when I was very young uh, still in my teenage years I didn't really like it at all I didn't understand what was going on but as I grew older and I, I started to uh, gain life experience in terms of getting married and having children and settling down with my family and then still uh, re-examining and uh, revisiting that work, I grew to love it. And now I'm just uh, completely enamored with the work. I'm, uh, I'm so stunned with it every time. So that's one example. I think another example perhaps would be in a very similar pattern of reappraisal on my part would be the Antonioni work, La Ventura. And La Ventura was a film that I also saw for the first time as a, a teenager and I don't think I was able to appreciate it very much at the time uh, due to my own uh, circumstances or my own uh, my own uh, sort of cinema journey uh, at the time which was still very much in its early uh, nascent period or nascent stages uh, but uh, over time and again with some more life experience under my belt uh, and reviewing that film I grew to uh, absolutely uh, find it uh, just deeply deeply uh, engaging uh, to the point that it's just uh, uh, a mesmerizing towering work so uh, that's another example of that um, and vice versa you ask so uh, the vice versa version of that might be um, let's see a film like say oh gosh maybe the the film the force awakens i think when i saw that in the theater i was really uh, entertained by it um, but uh, then i saw it again on uh, on disc and i while i can't say that i i dislike the film i th i think it has a lot of strengths to it i must say that i wasn't as engaged with it as I, I found myself not necessarily as engaged with it as I felt upon initial watch of the film. So um, I, again, I have to see how it holds up now, and I'll, I'll give it uh, some more time, of course, uh, and we'll have to wait and see. Maybe I'll, I'll try to watch it again uh, in the, the coming months, uh, especially considering the, the recent release of the of the third in that new trilogy so uh, but that's that's uh, your first question and your second question is is there a film uh, considered a classic from any decade that you have never seen um, I can mention the one of the most recent films because I'm very terrible with recent film watching 
but I have heard nothing but high praise about this film to the point where I think it's already now considered to be a supreme, supreme classic. And so this is the film uh, Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Now I've heard so many great, great things about this. I haven't heard too much. Uh, I'm, I'm avoiding hearing anything about specifics of the plot, so I, I don't want to hear anything about that because I don't want to get spoiled by it, but I think I am uh, really uh, just a... Um, how should I put it? I'm, I'm, that's one that is uh, heralded as being a classic already. It's already a classic, and I haven't seen it, and I really, really want to see it. So I guess I'm, I'm going to be waiting for the uh, criterion, the cri excuse me, I'm waiting for the criterion release of that. And so uh, once that shows up, then I'll be able to, uh, to really uh, dive into it and explore it more. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that criterion release. Uh, of that uh, very soon. So uh, anyways, I guess uh, hopefully that answers your question. So Heirloom Providence, my dear friend, thank you very much and I hope you are well. Uh, next is Alex Schiffer. So hello Alex, I hope you're well. Um, hi Daisuke. Number one, I wanted to know what your opinion is on the films of Takashi Miike. I'd love to see his films talked about on Film Club. Oh yes, yes so um, oh, and let me just say uh, your second question. Do you have a subscription to Shudder? Uh, if so, what are your overall opinions on the service, etc.? So I should just answer that second question first. So I don't have a Shudder a subscription. I'll, do, I'll be perfectly honest. I don't quite know what that is. Um, I'm not sure if it's available here uh, in Japan or anything like that. So I, uh, it could be. I'm not sure. But I, I, I don't uh, have a subscription. So... Um, so there's that. Uh, and as to your first question, uh, Takashi Miike, uh, yes, I'm a, a big admirer of his works, and his, he's got so many, of course, and so um, uh, it, it, it really depends on what film you're talking about, I suppose, because his, his tone and, and what his films are just are all over the place. And it's really hard to keep up. And I mean that in a very positive way. It's so hard to keep up with him, and that's brilliant about him. And uh, he's he's uh, he's got so many things that he wants to say. It's just unbelievable. Now, I suppose I could uh, let you know now that I am seriously considering. Uh, focusing one of the future film club sessions on a work by Takashi Miike. And so I haven't quite decided when exactly, but it is something that I have considered very, very seriously, in fact. And I almost had a Miike film chosen for me. I ended up not doing it. I went a different direction. But uh, that is also to say that I will very likely have a Miike film as a subject for discussion in a future live stream, film club live stream. So it's a really wonderful coincidence that you asked the question when you did. Um, and if I, if you want to be, uh, if I want to be more specific about it, I suppose the film that I, I would like to choose is uh, f probably going to be uh, Dead or Alive. But again, I haven't, or Hans Aisha, dead or alive, but I haven't quite decided yet. Um, if I could get the opportunity to talk about any Miike film, I would love it. But I think one that just has a, a, a truly raw, uh, sizzling energy about it from start to finish, and in particular, at its start and at its finish is the film Dead or Alive. So I would, and it has also a great release from Arrow. So I think that there is no problem in terms of accessibility of the film. And so I think if I had the chance, I would love to talk about Dead or Alive. And I'm seriously considering it. Um, I'm not sure exactly when, maybe June, maybe July, I'm not sure, but uh, hopefully very soon. But I'm very glad you asked, Alex. It's, it's very, uh, very timely that you make that question, so thank you very much. Next is uh, Lucas Act Forever. So, and you say, sorry, Daisuke, a third question. That's okay, my friend, uh, comes to my mind. Do you have any guilty pleasure 
In other words, do you like some movies or even TV series that you know it's pretty trash but you still enjoy it? For example, one of my guilty pleasures is the TV series Spartacus. I know it's trash, exaggerated, etc., but I still love it because it's funny. Okay, so I am... Um, uh, I, I admit I don't. Uh, I, I haven't seen any episodes of Spartacus. I, I I kind of heard about it a little bit, so I think I generally get the gist of what you're saying with respect to the example that you give Spartacus. I did answer a similar question I think in an earlier Q and A about guilty pleasures, and uh, I I brought up the the example I think of uh, of uh, um, how I was feeling a little bit. Uh, down uh, a couple months ago perhaps when this whole world crisis began to set in and I began to realize it the realization really dawned on me about how long-lasting the effects of this current situation will really be and I became very very sad and it just so happened at that timing that I uh, in my notifications feed or something I, I don't know exactly how it came across but um, I uh, managed to watch uh, the Corey Feldman music video, um, what was it, Ascension Millennium, and uh, that really put a smile on my face. It really did. I'm, I'm, uh, I was, uh, I felt lifted up. And so, uh, do, should I call that a guilty pleasure? I'm not sure because, uh, I mean, I understand uh, all the the attention that it got at the time of its release. I get all that, but it, it's still something that really. Uh, made me happy in a, in a moment in my life where I was feeling quite blue. So uh, I think that is something that I, I really, really appreciate and admire about that particular work. Um, so uh, I guess, yeah, that that's, uh, I hope that answers the question. But anyway, my dear friend, thank you very much for the additional follow-up question. I really appreciate it. Let's see, next is Lucas Rodriguez. Hi, Daisuke. I hope you're well. Thank you very much. I am. Thank you. And likewise, my friend, likewise. Uh, I have two questions that I'm really curious. One, what did you study in college? Two, if it's not too personal, what do you dedicate uh, besides YouTube? What do you dedicate to besides YouTube? Okay. So, uh, number one, what did you study in college? I studied history. I, uh, in my undergrad years, I studied history and uh, focused in on uh, Asian history, so Chinese history and Japanese history, and uh, and also I took courses. It wasn't my major, but I took courses in literature, and I also took courses in film studies and other requirement courses that I had to take. But my interest and focus, or foci, landed more on the the literature arts side and uh, um, the humanities and so that's what my focus was as an undergrad uh, but uh, I, I think I was I think I, I was not as good a student as I, I, I should have been I, sh I should have focused more on my studies uh, but um, it was still I think a great opportunity uh, to be able to uh, become exposed to all these different courses and uh, these brilliant, brilliant professors and uh, brilliant, brilliant uh, students uh, who are much, much smarter than I could ever hope to be. It was such a great opportunity. So, And of course, also in the context of this YouTube channel, it really helped me to explore further uh, the, the, the reaches of cinema because I had a really great cinema library, um, a, a film center, what it's called, and uh, I was able to uh, access so many films that I had never, ever uh, imagined I'd be able to see. I'd only read about or not even heard about many of them, most of them, but still it was just wonderful. And this was just around the time before DVDs really took off in the commercial market. And so uh, Laserdiscs were still uh, being manufactured. I think they were just about to be phased out, but uh, there was still a very... A respectable laserdisc catalog in the particular university. So uh, this was a great opportunity to to watch these things. So, uh, but that's what I studied in college. And then number two, if it's not too personal, what do you dedicate to besides YouTube? Um, no, I don't mind the question at all. Uh, I, I guess 
there's of course my my occupation, uh, my profession, and so I have to dedicate um, most of my time to that because uh, that is uh, my livelihood, and I have to support my family, and so that is what I dedicate uh, uh, a good chunk of my time to. And I've spoken a little bit about my profession uh, in past Q and A's, so uh, hopefully, if you're interested, you can take a look at those. Um, as far as other things, other I guess hobbies or interests, I also mentioned exercise. I'm very, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, into exercise and weight training, and I really like to to uh, go to the gym, or at least I did until this particular uh, world crisis set in. And because of that, um, I haven't been to the gym uh, voluntarily. I've been absent from the gym for uh, maybe the first month or so, and then. Uh, after that, the gyms started to temporarily close, and so I haven't been to uh, a proper gym workout uh, in in a good few months. And of course, I understand. Of course, of course, there are um, uh, at the moment there are more pressing things in the world. You know, more urgent things that need to be taken care of, namely just taking care of of uh, one's family and the people close to one. And in other words, not. Uh, going out uh, unless it's absolutely necessary and trying to observe those very important uh, guidelines uh, for the sake of not only one's own safety but the safety of those around you, the safety and health of those around you. So I totally get that. So uh, I'm very willing and, and very um, uh, and, and very proud to say that I'm, I'm doing my part, at least I'm trying to. But of course at the same time it, it also means that my lifestyle has changed quite dramatically. Uh, from what it used to be and what it used to be included uh, quite regularly going to the gym and so uh, but um, I've had to try to make do with the best uh, the best I can with what's available to, available to me now so uh, but uh, yeah that's something that I really really uh, was really into and I spent really a lot of time uh, at the gym trying to uh, uh, reach certain uh, uh, exercise goals and so you know bench press and uh, squ and the leg squat and the deadlift uh, as well as other exercises as well you know shoulder press and and and, uh, and arm curl for the biceps and also triceps and, and things like that so uh, just uh, uh, and I I had a, a training journal and and that sort of thing and and I had I mean, once a month I, I there was a, at the gym there's a sort of personal trainer thing and so I had a personal trainer as well and and uh, we uh, he'd create a kind of menu for me that I'd follow and then the menu would be uh, changed the next month etc so it was, it was a really great uh, uh, great time but again this has now changed and so I have I've had to adjust hopefully when all this stuff is behind us uh, then I can uh, return to that kind of lifestyle so I hope that happens soon um, and as far as other things I, I, I guess um, uh, there's the work there is uh, um, I didn't mention my family of course but I think that that I didn't mention because I suppose in my mind that sort of goes without saying of course but uh, uh, I have to uh, keep uh, my family uh, my top 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 priority so uh, there's uh, that of course and then there's work and then there's uh, I guess exercise um, and there are other uh, maybe hobbies or interests that I have um, uh, not I haven't spoken about them but I do have um, interests I'm I'm um, I don't drink as much as I used to but uh, I'm, I'm very much uh, into uh, a single malt uh, scotch and I don't I'm not a very strong drinker uh, so I can't uh, I, I'm not very good with wine uh, I usually get uh, sick uh, very quickly upon uh, drinking a glass or two of wine so I don't drink wine and I'm not that big of a beer drinker although I do drink beer uh, on occasion uh, but I'm I'm what I guess my my drink of choice has always been scotch and and uh, scotch whiskey and whiskey and uh, Japanese whiskey as well and so I've always been a big uh, fan of that and I have uh, quite a few bottles uh, here and uh, there's still uh, quite a few bottles that have uh, uh, quite a bit of of, uh, of uh, good scotch in them, and so uh, every once in a while I'll, I'll enjoy what's what's the word? I'll, I'll enjoy a good dram um, and and that. But um, I, I think I might have a picture of uh, the scotch that I have or had 
if you check my Instagram account, you might be able to find, I think there's a picture there, I'm not sure. Um, there might be something there. If not, I'll, I'll try to find something, maybe post it there. But yeah, I'm a, I, I, do like, uh, I do like scotch. So uh, there's that. But, and, but as I say, I don't drink as much as I used to. And even uh, back in the day, I wasn't that big of a drinker I'm, because I'm not that strong in terms of being able to hold my liquor. Uh, so um, I, I would consider myself a relatively light drinker to begin with, and and from there I become less and less of a drinker. As to, as to now, I probably don't have, I don't drink as much. Um, maybe um, I don't know, w once every two weeks or three weeks or so, something like that. So, um, but um, you know, so, but if there are friends over, or or if I go to someone's house, or you know, again before this whole crisis hit, and and we'd have. Uh, maybe uh, uh, house party or something. I'd always bring a bottle of scotch, and that would always take care of my my end, so to speak. So, um, so that would always be cool. So, uh, so again, when this whole world crisis is averted and it's behind us, maybe I'll be, go back to having home parties with uh, my friends here, and and I'll, I'll be able to share with them some bottles of scotch. Um, I can see it, it's off camera now, but it's right there on the other side of the room. I can see a bottle of Springbank staring me straight in the face. So uh, perhaps uh, this is uh, maybe after this video, maybe I should uh, uh, partake and have that once one drink every three week drink right now. So anyway, thank you very much for the question. Um, I hope you're doing well. Let's see. Uh, next is Paco Silva. And you say, hello. Hello, Daisuke. Hello. Uh, I hope you're doing well, my friend. Thank you very much. And likewise, I hope you are uh, safe and healthy and well. Pretty late to the party. No, you're not. Not at all. Uh, but I just read that the band Daft Punk is set to compose the soundtrack for the new Dario Argento film, which according to him will be a return to a crime film. What do you think of these news? Are you still excited for the new Argento films? Also, I wanted to ask if you ever listened to the Brett Easton Ellis podcast. Ellis is a famous author, mostly known for American Psycho, but he's been doing a podcast since the beginning of the decade, and he talks mostly about film culture. I've been a huge fan since the early days. He's controversial at times, but always interesting. He has interviewed great directors like Tarantino, Carpenter, or Walter Hill. Yes, um, and you have a third question, which I'll get to in a second. So yes, I, I know the um, that, that podcast, and so I, I don't he listen to it regularly, but I have heard a few of the episodes. So yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, and let's see, as for your first question. So yeah, so I, I believe someone mentioned this to me in passing in one of the comments. And I must admit that I didn't quite understand what it meant at the time. But now I realize, based on your comment, that uh, this is in reference to uh, a new Jar Dario Argento project. Now, I must admit that I'm, a, I'm pretty late to the game, and so I haven't read too many details. I mean, I did read something a while back, uh, but I did. This is the uh, I haven't heard anything until these comments about Daft Punk. So, uh, again, I think it's just because of this current world situation. Uh, my uh, my interests have been uh, focused elsewhere, and so I, I, I'm pretty late to the game when it comes to current film news. So I apologize if I, I don't have all the details now, but uh, this is very interesting. So, um, uh, again, uh, without knowing more, uh, I am, of course, as always, I am so welcome to any news of Dario Argento making a new film. So that's one thing. And I know there's, I, I've spoken about Dario Argento's uh, films on this channel uh, a year or so ago. And, uh, you know, there, there of course is, is this idea about his, his later uh, film career output versus his early film career output. Okay, I get all that. But even so, it is still great news to have uh, a new Dario Argento film almost uh, with us. And so uh, I am very excited about that. And of course, uh, we shall wait and see uh, what it ha what this is. And uh, it could be great. It could be maybe less than great. Who knows? But whatever it is, uh, we shall wait and see. And I I'm certainly looking forward to that, uh, to that uh, possibility. So that's great. And this news about Daft Punk. So this is a very 
I think uh, this is something that I wouldn't necessarily have thought of immediately, but uh, this feels like a very uh, interesting choice. Now, if you remember, um, Dario Argento, way back in the day, made a very, uh, at the time it was almost like, a, 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 it almost felt like an unusual choice with the choice of Goblin uh, to, uh, to rely on Goblin for uh, what ended up being a good portion of the uh, music soundtrack, the music score for the film Deep Red. Not all of that score, as you may know, was by Goblin. There was, uh, there was some other uh, um, uh, music there, uh, the Gaslini, um, more sort of orchestral side of the, the score there. But there was the other part of it, which was the Goblin score. And that became uh, a really big trademark of, of Argento's work uh, for the for a good portion of his career since then, of course. Uh, so this is a, to say that Argento has always had a really keen ear for uh, you know cutting edge music, and I'd like to think that this keen ear uh, has remained ever so keen uh, throughout his life. And uh, this kind of news is an indication to me that his keen ear is as keen as ever, let me put it that way. And so I have nothing but uh, great uh, feelings of excitement upon hearing this news. Again, uh, without knowing anything more about any, uh, knowing any specifics, we'll have to wait and see, of course. Uh, but this is uh, certainly uh, uh, very exciting news. So uh, anyway, thank you very much for sharing. And you have a third question, which is, have you ever had interest in pro wrestling I'm curious, since you've been living in both the United States and Japan, two countries with huge, huge wrestling cultures. So, yes, um, uh, I, I, uh, how should I put it? I have a, uh, I don't follow wrestling now, but I, uh, when I was a kid uh, growing up in um, the UK, and uh, in the US uh, at the time uh, I was really into uh, it was called the WWF at the time it's now called what's it WWE but I was really into that and uh, I remember and I was it was around the time of I just started to be, become a fan of it around the time I think it was after just after WrestleMania 6 and so my first real proper Wrestlemania was Wrestlemania 7 and so I, I was a really big fan I, I didn't quite understand what it was but it was such a big event and so I was I was really into Wrestlemania 7 and from there it was uh, it, it uh, I, I was really into um, uh, the, that wrestling and and um, uh, it, it was a, a really great time you know I, I was a big fan of um, of uh, you know, at the time he was called Macho King Randy Savage, and then he be and then he returned to Macho Man Randy Savage. So I so I really knew him more as Macho King, and uh, she, uh, he was there with um, it was her name Sensational Queen Sherry, uh, and then that whole thing with old Miss Elizabeth and uh, proposing to Miss Elizabeth in the squared circle. I thought was, that was really great. And I think uh, Mean Gene Okerlund was there as well. Uh, if I if my memory serves, um, and this was the time, of course, of of um, I remember earthquake, and there was tugboat who then became typhoon, and I think uh, he was also uh, in the WCW, um, uh, the Shockmaster, I think, uh, which is another great story, of course, uh, and this was also the time of um, uh, Dusty Rhodes was still active, and um, Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase was still active, um, and I remember, um, uh, let's see, uh, Dusty Rhodes, and also Dustin Rhodes uh, made his debut, and uh, first, I remember I saw the debut uh, uh, match uh, on TV, of course, of Dustin Rhodes, and this was before he became what was it, Gold Dust, um, and it was just Dustin Rhodes, and I thought it was it was really impressive. And I also remember I wasn't able to see what was it? It was the Survivor Series, the WWF Survivor Series, and this was where uh, Brother Love introduced to the world the Undertaker, 
and he was introduced as Cain the Undertaker. And I, I, I remember this because I couldn't watch it. was on pay-per-view, and I was so into it. But for whatever reason, my, you know, I was a kid, so I had had my, my parents to permission to be able to watch it. And for whatever reason, they didn't give me, they didn't allow me to watch it. Uh, but you could uh, hear it if you just p played it on the channel. And so I was so fascinated. I was just, I was just hearing it. it. was like listening to a radio broadcast. So you could hear it free of charge. And so I was hearing it. You couldn't see the picture, but I could hear it. And I could hear it was, you know, Cain, the Undertaker. And, it, and it, I think it was, now again, my memory is really faulty, but I think it was, I want to say it was um, uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper as well, who was doing the commentating. And he was just saying, oh, look at the size of that guy, you know, or something like that. Or maybe it was Bobby the Brain Heenan. I forget, forget exactly who, but it, it, but it was always, uh, look at the size, look at the size of it. And it was just huge. And I just remember it being built up in my mind. I was just listening to it, but hearing the, the entrance of The Undertaker. But just, and uh, uh, it, this was, uh, this, again, this was uh, during Brother Love. And this was before the, the, uh, the emergence of Paul Bearer. And I actually remember the the transfer of power. I remember that scene. I actually saw it when it was broadcast on TV, when Brother Love gave the reins over to uh, Paul Bearer. And so that was a really interesting. And then, of course, Paul Bearer and The Undertaker became this this very famous, iconic duo during this phase of wrestling. So that was great. And and also, um, uh, this was uh, I you know I, this was where uh, you know um, Brett the Hitman Hart. And Jim the Anvil Nightheart, they were formed. They formed the tag team, uh, the Heart Foundation, and uh, so this was all before all that stuff with the uh, uh, Montreal screw job and all that. So all that stuff was after I, I, I kind of lost interest and I, I wasn't following wrestling after that. But when I was really into just watching wrestling as a kid, it was the, the Heart Foundation. Uh, was it the Legion of Doom, right? Um, there was also the Bushwhackers, um, and uh, oh gosh, there were so many others. I forget, but uh, this this was a great. And also, um, uh, Hacksaw Jim Duggan was still around. Mister Perfect, uh, and he'd do the thing with his gum, right? He'd spit the gum and he'd hit it and flick it with his his hand, and he'd always say before he'd do his finishing move, he'd always shout out, "Now you're gonna see a perfect plex." And so I, I I remember that and and um, um, uh, gosh um, what was the name it was uh, Sean it was um, well I forget the name of the the tag team but what was the name it was Sean Michaels and Marty Janetti is that am I getting that right um, and they formed a tag team and so they were they what's the phrase uh, the um, good guys what is it faces. And uh, this was before Shawn Michaels became a heel, uh, but there was that, and and um, uh, and Hulk Hogan was was of course there, and Hulk Hogan and uh, the Ultimate Warrior. So uh, the Ultimate Warrior was still a big star. I think this was after the sort of afterglow, if you will, of WrestleMania six. But um, oh gosh, um, and also yes, um, Earthquake. Earthquake, and I, I mentioned Earthquake, right? But I thought Earthquake was just this huge, towering force of nature and um, just unbeatable. That's what I thought. And then uh, then we had also um, uh, Jake the Snake Roberts. And that was one of the storylines that really got to me as a kid was that it was the storyline between Jake the Snake Roberts and Earthquake. And at the time, Jake the Snake Roberts had the snake. Uh, I think it was a boa constrictor, I think. And it was uh, it was always in the sack, and the snake's name was Damien, and the thing that happened between Jake the Snake Roberts and Earthquake and Damien, was something that I will never ever forget. I saw that as a kid, and I was just, I was traumatized. <laughs> I was traumatized as a kid when I saw that. So, um, uh, and then I I kind of lost interest uh, for whatever reason. I don't know. Maybe it was just time, or just I I. I had to focus in on other things I forget but um, I, I just lost interest and uh, I, I didn't uh, pick it up again but uh, you know I'd hear a little bit uh, things here and there about about it and uh, uh, it's a fascinating world um, 
Uh, maybe one of these days I should try to get back into it. But now it, it's I'm I don't know all the th the details of it now, and so um, all right. So, so this was again uh, during a pretty short. I mean I remember also uh, Doink the Clown. Do you remember Doink the Clown? Um, his name was Doink the Clown, right? And uh, uh, I also remember. Um, uh, when Bobby the Brain Heenan made this big deal about introducing the narcissist, and every week he'd say something about the narcissist is coming, I'm going to introduce the narcissist, and it ended up being, uh, and then finally it came the day when he'd introduced the narcissist, and it was the narcissist Lex Luger. So Lex Luger made his debut uh, as a, a wrestler for the WWE, uh, and now it's called the WWE. So. Uh, yeah, so there's that, and I think, as I mentioned, I was I went to high school in Stanford, Connecticut, and I think the yes, the WW at the time was WWF, so their headquarters were in Stanford, Connecticut, and I do remember this because they had this sort of black square square shaped building, you know, I think in downtown Stanford, and they had the logo which was uh, adorning the the top floor, and so whenever one drove by, maybe on the highway or something, you could always see that logo on the building. And it was that logo, you know, the WW at the time, WWF. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, it's, yeah. I'm, I'm. But again, I don't follow it now. But, uh, um, yeah, so there's that. So anyway, thank you very much, Paco, and I, I hope you're well. Um, and with that, um, let me just end it there. And so again, I'm very sorry for uh, if I didn't get to your question, but I will go through the questions as uh, as as quickly as I can. So. Um, uh, and so I will see you in future Q&A videos. So until we meet again, my friends, once again, please continue to be well, stay safe, and take very good care of yourselves. And until we meet again, thank you and cheers.